and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we talk to subject matter experts about the economic, the financial, the business and the social impact of coronavirus. My guest today is someone who's not only a, a serial entrepreneur, he's become a full-time trader of the financial markets and of cryptocurrencies, and he's now got a whole tribe of followers on his realistic trader platform. His name is Siam Kid. Siam, welcome to the show. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me again. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, great. Now, uh, Siam, let, let's start with the, the big picture. What's your take on the, the, the steps that governments are taking around the world and the kind of economic impact that this is going to have as, as these things kind of come home to roost? I, I guess, as the Borg would say, resistance is futile in this um, particular situation. Um, I think most people have their heads well and truly buried under the sand at the moment and are oblivious of what's about to happen. And people are think, uh, I mean, I have even spoke to a fund manager who's like, oh yeah, we'll probably have a, a slight recession, but we'll have, you know, probably a V, re, v re, uh, reversal. And I, I was dumbfounded. Um, we are looking at something worse than the depression. And we're looking at something far time, far worse than 2008. Um, I think it won't be like a 15 year depression like we saw from the 1966 depression. Um, I think it's gonna be a very short and deep uh, depression. So something like two years, maybe maybe three if it squeezes, uh, elongates it a bit, um, but it's gonna be deep. So if you look at the 2008 crash, that was I think a 50% pullback um before it then um bottomed out i think we're looking at something more like the 1929 depression uh and in 1929 that crashed by about 85 percent so at the moment we had that the, or it, when you look at the equities or the indices we had the fastest equity crash in history um it took literally weeks to have a minus 30 uh, or 30 percent crash and if you look at the market so as it's what the 8th of April as we're speaking today um, we're on a bit of a, a relief rally and a few weeks ago I actually was screaming on Facebook saying don't be fooled by the coming relief rally and as we've seen right now it's pulled back to about 40 odd percent so typically when you look at every crash every major so every crash that's gone that's crashed more than 20 percent over the last hundred years um, it's something like 70 to 80 percent of them have a 40 to a 50 percent re relief rally which is exactly what we're seeing right now and then we see far for uh, further falling so we the lows that we made uh, whatever mark in index you're looking at we're going to take those lows out and it's going to fall a lot further so yeah if um if the absolute low that we've seen so far is what i think minus 39 percent we, yeah, I'm looking at something like at least a 60 to 70 percent crash from top of drop to bottom of drop. Yeah, and, and yet, you know, you, you, you read about the fact that loads of people are now opening up brokerage accounts because they think they can now buy a bargain. Um, uh, yeah. I, you know, I was thinking the other day, imagine a scenario where I, I own some fancy branded chain of hotels. Um, I long ago did a sale and lease back. So I don't own the bricks and mortar. I just have my brand name and I'm operating them. They've now all been closed by these regulations. So effectively, you know, what do I own? What is a reasonable share price for my company? There's a strong argument that it's zero. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's, um, we're living, we've, I guess since 1975, um, really since the end of the Bretton Woods, um, system we've had i guess the petrodollar system and we've basically been in a form of crony capitalism where every 10 years capitalism has to be bailed out by socialism <laughs> which i find uh, just completely comical um so yeah and and i when i guess as an investor one of the most prudent things you can do is you have to do like the deepest dive research you can and then when you when you have assimilated all of the the, the facts and figures etc come up to a reasoned stance and then once you've i guess put your your stake in the ground of, of what your i guess what your belief is 
you then, first of all, you need to be continually liquid or um, as a fluid with your, with your opinion. Um, so when new data arises, you need to shift your opinion based on new data. A lot of people don't do that. And also 90% of your research needs to be why you're wrong. So you don't know what you don't know. And basically for the last, I guess, month, I've been trying to prove myself wrong of, you know, what am I missing here? What would it take for us to not have further falling? And for this to be a V reversal, and we're going to go back to all time highs, etc. Um, and I'm still coming up with blank. I'm, I'm extremely open minded, but I cannot f fathom, I cannot think of anything that would basically pull us out of this. And the way and I, I always go back to oh, first principle thinking, you, you boil th something down to the fundamental truth. And I keep thinking, right, when you look at the global economy, and I guess for the average person watching this, the easiest way to equate this is to imagine the global economy as, I don't know, 10 people, 10 average people with jobs, okay? And what does the average person do these days? They, you know, they have a job, they have a, you know, a steady income, they, you know, they're living beyond their means. I mean, if you look at the UK, the average UK citizen spends 150% more than they earn, which is ridiculous. Um, the UK citizen is the best in the world at spending more than we earn. Um, it bet, better than the Australians, better than the, the, the Americans. So, so we spend, spend, spend. Interest rates are pretty low, uh, well, zero, pretty much. Um, cheap, cheap credits, we borrow, borrow, car finances, mortgage, because everyone loves a mortgage these days. Um, and then we have a little bump in the street. So I know your car breaks down, the boiler breaks, something happens and you need to spend, I know, a few thousand pounds in fixing it. Now, most people don't have five, 10 grand laying around to fix a, a problem like that. So what happens is that you end up going to a payday lender, like I won't say the name, but you all probably think of what I'm thinking, some dodgy, you know, payday company and you get a loan. And then that is the, the beginning of the downward spiral. So what you end up doing is that you're, yeah, it, it's game over. And then eventually, or you keep on borrowing and borrowing, but the only thing holding up this very loose pack of a house of cards is your job or your business, basically your income stream. When you lose your job, it's game over because then you end up doing more borrowing until no one lends to you. And then you have to default you have to default on some or all of your obligations and you go bankrupt you then if it's a person you have a one-year sin bin i guess one year financial holiday um, and then you start over again so what's happening so when you equate that sort of analogy to the world economy right now everyone has had that bump in, in you know that um that jolt and we are all struggling to pay the minimum interest only repayments on our credit card debt, let's say. And guess what's just happened? We've all lost our jobs at exactly the same time. Coronavirus, or whether you think it's um, a fake or not, I don't, I don't really care. Um, you ha what is undeniable is the effect that this COVID-19 has had on the planet. Everyone has had to drop tools, everyone. Never in human history has literally, I guess, the best part of the whole you know, developed world been forced to shut shop and drop tools. Um, I mean, I've got nine businesses. I've had to basically close down four of them. I've had to furlough all sorts of staff, um, 50 plus staff. We, like, and all my business, like everyone is in the same boat. And when you look at every country's main income stream, pretty much, it's tax revenue. So all of our tax revenue is just evaporated. And basically for every three days that a country drops to tools that the gdp drops by one percent so like we we're screwed we're absolutely screwed there's nothing that i can logically see that will basically take us back to the previous all-time highs in february well i mean also just to reinforce that you know that as i understand there were 6.6 .6 million job losses in america just last week alone um, and then you add in, yes, the tax is disappearing, but the spending is going through the roof. We thought we were, uh, you know, dodging a bullet when we didn't get a Jeremy Corbyn government, but now here's a, a supposedly Tory government throwing trillions at this problem. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realise that those, those government bonds that are getting issued are effectively a claim on future taxation 
which yep. means that at some point the taxes are going to have to go up massively to cover this. So I suppose the one good part of all this for you as a trader would be that you, you like volatility because you can do much better in a volatile environment. Have you been able to trade these scenarios in a profitable yeah. way? It's been amazing. I, I hate and I cringe saying that, but as a trader, it's these sorts of events where you, I guess, you make your profit. Now, I know that a lot of people will probably hate me for, for saying that, but it's just it's a fact. You, as a trader, you need volatility. Um, you need, you know, big, heavy surges. Um, and that's what we're seeing right now. Um, so, yeah. But and, and here's the thing, like, it, you, as a trader, what I would also say is that you, you can use these events to, I guess, really beef up your trading account and then use that profit to do good. Um, if that makes sense so yeah no, absolutely so so um you know what what have been the kind of things that you've been able to trade successfully uh because obviously some of this has happened so fast that you, you need mm. to jump in and out pretty quickly but how have you managed to actually you know leverage this into successful trades indices and oil primarily so what you'll find is that or and copper i guess so um Oil is the blood of the planet. It's like the it's the grease, the lubricant that keeps things going. It's you know I guess it is the blood. It's our energy source. I guess um, as the world has basically ground grinded to a stop, the 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 demand of oil in therefore goes down. So oil has literally fallen off a cliff at the same time. We're now at twenty odd dollars. Oh no, last time I checked, it was twenty four dollars a barrel. Um, but we basically slid from fifty down to twenty very very fast. Um, Oil will go. My 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 target for my oil trades is to take profit at ten dollar barrel. So I, I see oil hitting ten dollars a barrel pretty easily. Um, when you combine that with another converging bullet for oil of solar and battery technology, it's it's game over for oil. We will not see hundred dollar oil again unless there's World War Three, which I think is unlikely. Um, we're going through World War Three in an economic sense right now. So, um, what's the last thing any country needs right now? So, yeah, oil is screwed. Uh, game over. In fact, as of 2018, solar is the cheapest form of energy on the planet. So, yeah, extremely bearish on oil, um, medium to long term. Copper, that's going to, or that has fallen, and it's still going to fall because the world is not moving. The world is not constructing and building stuff as it were. Hell two months ago so that's going to slide further but the, yeah again shorting the indices so um yeah so we're I was shorting the indices i called this relief rally um this relief rally is is happening as we speak and now i'm just waiting for the net for it just to roll over again and we're going to see it's going to take out those lows and go beyond so for now obviously it's my advice here is pointless and useless for most or is inactionable for most people probably listening to this so what i would highly recommend if my opinion has any weight on you as a viewer if you're an average person and let me just define that a bit if you are someone that has any form of conventional asset like an index linked sip index linked stock and shares isa anything that is connected or linked to the stock market whatsoever um I would highly recommend you to start. This is not financial advice, okay? Um, this is just my Siam opinion hat on. Um, and this is where I basically go against what most IFAs and what most fund managers do. So at the moment, most IFAs and fund managers are saying, don't exit, don't just play the long game. You need to basically stay still, don't do anything because you're playing the long game. But the thing is, if you look at what most fund managers and IFAs have done to most people's life savings in the 2001 crash, the 2008 crash, hell, go back to 1966, same thing. It's the same advice that screws people over. I think, Graham, you, you yourself in 2000, the tech bubble, your That's fund right. manager. I, I, I got well screwed at that point, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, contrarian investing is, is the way forward. And so what you should do, I don't know how this is going to be. Um, so what, is this on the left for you? Is that? Is that a chart? Does that look like a normal chart? Yeah, that, that'll do. That that'll work. work. <laughs> so, okay. So let's say, for example, you have, I don't know, let's call it 100 chicken nuggets, okay? Um, or 100 units or whatever. And the price is 10, let's say. So 100 nuggets at 10 pounds, you've got 1,000 pounds worth of stuff. Now, at this level here, 
we've had a crash, let's say it's now five pounds. So your hundred nuggets is now worth 500 pounds. So what most people are saying is don't do anything, just wait because in the long run, 10 years time, whatever, you're going to go back, back to break even or whatever. Now, yes, you need to play the long game, but you need to do it properly. And that's where everyone does it really badly. You do not just put your head in the sand and hope because hope is the world's worst investment tool. So what you should do in, again, my Siam opinion hat on is that you need to exit now. You need to ignore the people say, oh yeah, but you're crystallizing all of your losses. No, what's gonna happen is you exit now five pounds. So your hundred nuggets, is basically you've, liquid, you've got 500 quid. You then wait for the further falling and there is extremely high probability we can see much further falling. And then when the price gets down to, I don't know, two, two pounds, and that is when you basically buy. So basically for me, I'm looking at at least a 70% fall from top of drop to bottom of crash. So when we, yeah, so let's say it gets to two or three, call it three, then you, in fact, what was it? 500 divided by three is my trusted calculator. Now you've got 166 chicken nuggets. So you've basically increased the amount of chicken nuggets you've got. So when it goes back to 10, guess what? You, you're in a far better position. And depending on when you get in, you'll be up anywhere from 50 to 100% ROI or better position than, than before. So, um, so that's one thing. Um, and that's what I've really been screaming to my close friends and family, whether they listen or not, it's, it's their call. Um, what else? Uh, going to cash is also a very good thing. So if you have I guess in anything, go to cash because what that will do is give you some pouncing money. So when we, you know, we get near the lows in a year or two years time, whenever it may be, um, you'll it'll be, you'll be like a kid in a candy shop, you know, back when fruit salads were a penny and Freddo's were 10 pence. Um, okay. uh, yeah. Now, yeah. So clearly I think you know, there's a very strongly expressed view there on your direction for the, 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 you know, the stocks and shares part of the market. If we look at some of the other assets, um, you know, bonds, obviously, again, the, the, the traditional IFA will say bonds are a safe haven. What's your view of bonds in this kind of market? Game over. 90, at least 97% of the world is, uh, um, of the current or the money out there is actually debt. Money is debt. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. So the way, I guess it's a bit of a Ponzi scheme, really. So when a government wants to basically increase the currency supply, they, they basically have to buy that they sell government debt basically bonds that ious um this is the it's a bit too long to get into and in in, i guess in this interview the bond market is screwed look at the yields yeah. we've got inverted yield curves we, we like we, it's i would not touch anything conventional so in fact no matter who you are you are taking a bet so if you're going to cash what you're doing is that you are betting of the stability of the sterling or the dollar or whatever it be and you're you're basically betting that the government and the bank of england is going to look after sterling if you go into property you're you're placing a bet that property is going to weather the storm if you go into gold you you so no matter what you're doing you are placing a bet if you do nothing you're hoping you're betting that the world economy is going to sort itself out and everything is going to be fine so let's let's talk about those two then. A uh, uh, property is obviously something that a lot of people watching this have got a lot of money invested in. So what what's your take on the impact on the property market of COVID nineteen? Again, game over. I, I I know I sound like a perma bear at the moment, and it's like the world is ending. But I'm 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 called the realistic trader for a reason. I I'm just being realistic here. Um, the so what at the moment everything's frozen. So the property market is pretty much frozen. There's not many buying or selling. Um, I guess rent is, you know, stable-ish. I know there's some landlords struggling with renters that are just refusing to pay rent now. Um, but <clears throat> what's likely to happen is once the market starts opening up again, we're going to start seeing a slide in in property um, because the. I, I guess you have to you have to look at public. Uh, Let's, let's take a few steps back. So if you go back to the Weimar Republic, so the hyperinflation back in, in Germany, um, what, it was one of the, the worst hyperinflations ever. I know it's a bit of an extreme example, but it, it sort of really highlights um, public sentiment. So what happened is that they, they, 
they did the normal levers. They, you know, dropped interest rates. They tried to print loads of currency to try and kickstart the economy, to get people spending, get the economy going. And that's pretty much what every central bank has ever done for the last hundred years, basically. Um, but it never works. It never works. So when the markets get to, you know, proper capitulation stages and the public is scared, you could drop it, you know, 10,000 pounds into most families, you know, during the, the proper capitulation phase. And it won't kickstart the economy because people's money habits and spending habits change. So if all of a sudden, you know, the stock market kills those, those previous lows we've just got, and we, it really starts um, ramming down and we've got all sorts of lockdown stuff with, you know, Corona and all that, whatever. Basically, everyone's scared and people are not working. They're losing income or most people are, are financially worse off at the moment. So any money that government does gift us or give us or loan to us, um, they're not going to spend it on a new fancy car. They're not going to be buying new whatever. They're going to be hoarding it. They're, they're going to keep it. So what tends to happen is that that, that stimulus never actually gets into the economy. Um, and so this is one contributing reason why I see property is, is going to go down. So, so personally... So that's, a, that's a no to, a no to shares, a no to bonds, a no to property. What, what about yeah. you and I first met in your days as a gold bullion dealer? Where, where does gold sit in all this? It's so. I am bullish. I'm, I'm bearish short term. I'm bullish medium to long term. So what happens because we're in a world of like literally a massive web of spider web of derivatives. Um, a lot of people think gold is inversely correlated to stocks. It's not. Um, if you go back 300 years ago, yes, it was. Stocks go down, but gold bullion goes up. But these days, because of all the ETFs, what actually happens is that gold and stocks, they, they move in lockstep. So that's why we saw the markets crash, gold and silver crash with it. And that's simply because of the paper gold and silver out there, ETFs. But what then happens is that there's a supply, um, there's a, 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 a demand and supply squeeze. So what happens is um, the physical, so all the strong hands out there go, oh my God, every, you know, gold's on a fire sale. Let's hoard, let's buy up loads of cheap gold and silver. And then the supply just evaporates. So if you go to, you know, pretty much any bullion dealer right now, their delivery times have gone from one day to 30 day waiting in de delivery times. So what happens is that you have this disconnect where, as in the supply demand disconnect, where the paper price of bullion carries on going down and then the physical price goes up. So we haven't had that yet. So as stocks continue to plummet, I see gold and silver also probably, probably plummeting very in the short term, but I'm, I'm very bullish long term. So that's that, but I'm a wealth, I'm in, I'm in wealth generation. Okay. So I don't, you know, you should never be like property is the way to get rich. Trading is the only way to get rich. You have to use the correct vehicle at the correct time. So right now, I would say going to cash is very prudent. So go to cash right now, but don't just go to cash for the next five years because cash is going to, you know, there's all sorts of rubbish going to happen. They'll, they'll, I wouldn't be surprised if they're capital controls, there will maybe be bail-ins, et cetera. So going to cash, yeah, so you have to, again, you have to time it. So going to cash is good for now. Um, it won't be long, I, I see, where... I think you're probably going to use the whole Corona stuff as an excuse to get rid of cash, as in physical cash. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen at the moment is that the, the way they create currency or money is through debt. Basically, the government gets in debt to its central bank. Um, and so the only way to basically create new, new money, currency out there, is to get into more debt. But it doesn't need to be that way. So one thing the government is able to do is to create money or create currency without a central bank okay so without doing the whole shell game of um buying selling buying and selling uh bonds and treasury bonds etc um so what's probably going to happen is that the government's probably going to force the the central bank and it'll be in every country so, so um so they're going to try and get a, every central bank into i guess retail banking so they'll create a digital version of the sterling for example and what will probably happen is that we'll have a bank holiday at some point banks will close for a week maybe two and during this they'll outlaw physical cash um and you'll have a window of opportunity to go and give the cash etc and what they'll do is let's say and i think this will probably happen after the first mainstream bank goes bust so I, I do see a major bank going bust, whether it's Santander, HSBC, probably Deutsche Bank first to begin, mm. most likely. 
Um, so when that happens, so let's say you have, I don't know, 10 grand in your Barclays account, et cetera. Let's say Barclays go bust. Um, <clears throat> the government will not, I don't see the government bailing out the banks like they did in 2008 again. I think there'll be public outcry. Um, I think what they'll do is the government will probably be on more of the public side than bailing out the bankers again. So what's probably going to happen is they will let the banks go bust. This is my crazy um, forecast. I, I, I see big, big banks going bust and there's going to be like, Le like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers all over again. But what will happen is if you had to say 10 grand in your account, what they'll probably do is go, right, um, we've now got digital sterling. They won't call it crypto sterling. They'll call it digital sterling. Um, they'll probably increase the contactless limit at the moment it's 30 pounds they'll probably increase that a bit and they'll go right uh, we had 10 grand in your account you now have an e-wallet you, you now have a digital wallet and guess what you've now got 10 grand of digital sterling and what they're going to do is they'll, they'll just replace the whole sterling currency with digital sterling currency mm -hmm. but unfortunately the hmrc and the government will then have full optics on all everyone's financial affairs so going to cash like that if you stay in cash, not good. So I would, just, yeah, go to cash right now and basically get out of anything stock related. Um, I would, I guess, I know, again, this sounds crazy. I would wait a bit because I see, I also say, see crypto like Bitcoin falling uh, a bit as well. So I do think cryptos will be a hedge against economic uncertainty, but not again, like gold, it's, um, at the moment, people are crashing. They don't want to really spend it. They want to basically get, you know, the, secure their family and food and buy more toilet paper. I don't know. Um, so, but eventually, is there, when they is, start... there, is there an argument? Because you're talking, obviously, some of these things happen very quickly. Is there an argument for saying that you should be sort of drip feeding, perhaps on a monthly basis, into these things, so that you you kind of, you know, the old pound cost averaging idea that is that going to be a safer strategy than trying to time the absolute yeah. bottom of the market? Yeah, pound cost averaging is always a safer bet than trying to time it. I mean, I've been trading 15 years and I still get it wrong all of the time. Um, so, yeah, pound cost averaging. But I would say I, I wouldn't start buying into stuff until we've, you know, at least hit 50% crash. We haven't hit that 50% crash level yet. I think it's 39%. So, yeah, there, there's more falling. So I would, yeah, I, I would... I would put a little bit of money into Bitcoin. I really would, because when they start inflating the currency supply away, um, that they, it's only going to increase the value and also price of Bitcoin, because you cannot inflate Bitcoin. Um, and is, is, would you argue, I know in the past that there's been all sorts of other uh, uh, cryptocurrencies created, and some have got some traction, many haven't. Would, would you recommend spreading uh, uh, funds across more than just Bitcoin in the crypto world? Or? I wouldn't really. No, there's like when I got into cryptos, there was like 500 cryptos. I think last time I checked, not long ago, there's almost 6,000 cryptos, but most of them just they they, they disappear. Um, it, Bitcoin, whatever your opinions is, it's the only one that's been battle tested over a 10-year period now, um, or 11-year period. So it's yeah, I I would have a little bit of money in Bitcoin as a hedge, um, but basic yeah. Um, okay. I, I, yeah, and, and, and obviously we talked a lot about your trading strategy and the, sh the short-term issues that you're 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 managing through. What about your long-term personal investment strategy? What what do you see as the, the sort of basis of building your you and your family's long-term wealth? Mm. So there's a really good saying. I, forget, I don't know who said it, um, but the ultimate insurance policy is having the six G's: gold, guns, grub, ground, gasoline, generator. Um, so, so I've always had that in the back of my mind and an insurance policy is something which you hope you never need to call on right you have life insurance but you've, you really hope you don't have to you know exercise that life insurance so in terms of financial insurance the six G's is, is a good thing um, it's worth having six months supply of you know maybe not guns but you know gold guns grub ground gasoline generator etc so basically you, you you as a family unit have a you know, food in your belly, roof on your head, water, you know, etc. So I've got six months of the six G's. So I know that, you know, whatever Corona rubbish happens, I'm, you know, my fam, my immediate family is safe. So that's one thing. Um, the, the long term. So for me, my personal play is basically to trade the market. Uh, Cause that, that's just my skill. That's my job. 
my job is to sit at home in my underwear trading. Um, and then I'm going to convert a portion of that into cryptos. So that is a so by basically going into cryptos is my hedge against the governments doing what they always do and inflating the currency supply away. I mean, they can't really drop interest rates any lower. So the only lever they got now is to pump more currency. And then the moment they do that, yeah, your purchasing power disappears. Um, I, I see capital controls in, I see bail-ins in the future. So again, that's why crypto or Bitcoin is a hedge against that. Um, I will actually be going long on Tesla. I will be buying Tesla stock. It's probably the only stock I will buy um, once we get to further falling. Um, a lot of people think Tesla's business model is selling cars, but I, th I would do more research if, if that's what you think. M Tesla will make more money with um, solar power, industrial solar and residential solar than cars. And they will be basically turning the whole automobile industry from selling cars into a task, uh, transport as a service. So yeah, so I'm, I'm basically, long story short, I'm bullish on Tesla. So I'll have basically cryptos, Tesla, and then, guess what, in a year, two, three years time, or any time from now to the next couple of years, it's going to be an absolute playground if you have the skills of buying businesses. Mm. So, I mean, we have the baby boomers, they're all between the age of about 68 to 75 years old right now. Um, as a demographic, a lot of them have businesses. Um, they have, they have a higher proportion of biz, business owners than most other demographics. And guess what? They're all selling. And a lot of them are selling for pennies on the pound because technology has actually just removed a lot of barriers to entry. Like it, it's never been easier to set up a business these days. Um, like you can set up a website, take money from your website, um, get loads of eyeballs on your website very cheaply. Whereas back in the day you couldn't. So a lot of businesses are now having to undersell in order to bang out. Um, so yeah, but again, this is all very well me saying that because I can trade and I have a bunch of businesses. I guess for the, for the average person out there, it's, it's a lot harder. Uh, like I'm trying to imagine someone that, you know, hasn't been in business before, doesn't invest, doesn't have, you know, know how to trade, etc. What does that person do? And I think it would be very wise to use this time to develop new skills, we were stuck at home. We're under house arrest, pretty much. It's like Christmas, you know. Everything's shut. The fridge is full of full of food. You need to be be developing new skills, and I think the new skills for the next few years are going to be, um, I guess, on anything online related. Trying to come up with an online business. I guess online marketing skills is going to be very good. I mean, how what does a business get sales? You need leads. How do you get leads these days? online so i think on learning online marketing i guess is probably a good prudent skill but i just want to cut oh yes yeah, so going back to the, the average person what do they do i think the simplest thing to do is have a little bit of bitcoin have a little bit of gold and silver um maybe buy a little bit of tesla when it gets lower um but i yeah and yeah go to cash so Siam, we're obviously in the middle of a crisis right now, but if, if we look out, you know, the next sort of three to five years, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on the future of the, the mm. world? Um, I think it's going to be extremely prosperous. So basically, if you, if basically every demographic has a thing which they latch onto as they hit peak earning part of it. So peak earning is between 35 and 45 years old. And if you go back 20 years, the generation X, they converged with the internet. And then that has created everything basically. Um, so now we have the millennials, which is the biggest demographic in history, human history, all converging on about 10 technologies, which are in exponential growth from 3D printing to AI, etc. So I think over the next, you know, from three years onwards, it's going to be extremely bullish. Uh, I think there's going to be all sorts of am amazing industries being built, uh, like virtual reality, augmented reality, etc. So yeah, uh, it's going to be amazing once this uh, this passes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great, great advice there. And uh, you know, those of us who follow you on uh, Facebook may have seen you wandering around the streets of Norfolk in a dinosaur outfit. <laughs> should, should we be worried about the impact on your mental health of this lockdown? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'm doing the typical Zoom thing right now. I'm dressed from the waist up. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much information. Siam Kid, thank you very much for joining us.